each year, the graduating class elects a member of the faculty to speak at their commencement. And this year, they have made a very wise choice. The class of 2015 has selected as its speaker, Daniel Markovitz. who is the Guido Calabrese Professor of Law. <laughs> Daniel received his AB summa cum laude from Yale, where he won a Marshall Scholarship to study economics, econometrics, at the London School of Economics and the, at the University of Oxford. He returned to New Haven in 1997 and enrolled at this law school during which time he simultaneously worked toward and in 1999 was awarded a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford. He received his JD the following year, after which he clerked on the Second Circuit for the great judge and former dean, after whom Daniel's chair is named, Guido Calabresi. And we were wise enough to hire Daniel the year after that. Daniel's works reflects the diversity of his talents his writings range from contracts to legal ethics, from distributive justice to corporate law to democratic theory. In each area, his guiding question has been how law can be structured to promote respectful human cooperation, even among those who hold drastically different worldviews. Professor Markovitz discovers the possibility for such cooperation in the oddest places. For example, in contracts between self-interested buyers and sellers, in litigation between adversary disputants, and in political competition between opposing parties. In each case, Professor Markovitz argues, interactions that on first glance appear entirely competitive actually contain elements of mutual respect that can be harnessed to produce a fairer and more inclusive social order. In a world of pervasive and all too often facile interdisciplinarity, Daniel is one of those extremely rare persons who is actually a true polymath. His work is exceptional, both in its breadth and its depth. He is expert in disciplines ranging from mathematical economics to the common law of contracts, from philosophical theories of justice to legal ethics, and if Yale is a faculty that refuses to recognize the sanctity of traditional disciplinary lines, Daniel represents the essence of the intellectual, intellectual audacity and mastery of this place. But he also exemplifies this institution's soul in another dimension. One of our oldest and most distinguished faculty members observes of Daniel that, and I'm quoting him now, it is a mystery how anyone could be so tall bald, fierce looking, and yet in fact be so kind. <laughs> More than anyone I know, Daniel has a great soul. He cares deeply about the well-being of his friends, his students, his colleagues, and this institution. And he is virtually constituted by his empathy, generosity, and respect for others. And this has made Daniel a kind of midwife for what is best in his friends and colleagues and students. He helps each of us accomplish what we most dearly would like to achieve. A first year student who was in his small group this fall said it best, I'm quoting the student, the student said, Professor Markovitz has strong, even radical political views, but I only learned that after I pushed him really hard in office hours, yet you'd never know it from his teaching. He engages everyone's ideas, challenges them to develop and support their own views, even those with which, it turns out, he personally disagrees. Daniel represents the best of Yale, both in his care for those around him and in his care for the common good. And he has an unusually keen perception of the common good because he also possesses an extremely rare combination of profound intellectual rigor and personal modesty. Samuel Johnson, an English essayist, once wrote, quoting him, integrity without knowledge is weak and useless, and knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. Few understand and live that credo more fully than Daniel Markovitz. 
for him, a commitment to truth and a commitment to justice are inseparable. He challenges each of us to approach the world with concern for the rigor and moral consequences of our principles. And his precision might be mistaken for disinterest, but it is not. It is quite the opposite. Compassion might be a more accurate description. Daniel is filled with the kind of compassion that is informed by a sense of what is actually best for all concerned. Compassion, one might say, the way a superb physician or lawyer might be compassionate. Compassionate, compassion that is discerning and deep rather than sentimental and shallow. Daniel stands out because of his compassion, integrity, and rigor. He stands out as a teacher and as a friend. He stands out as a scholar and as a colleague. And he stands out for his distinctive vision of law as a medium in which we might, just might, create justice in the midst of our collective and fallen human condition. So it's my deep pleasure to introduce this year's commencement speaker, Professor Daniel Markovitz. Thanks, Robert, for that uh, immensely exaggerated introduction. <laughs> and thanks enormously to the marvelous Yale Law School class of 2015 for inviting me to speak here. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure, just a real pleasure to teach you, and it's a privilege to address you now. Um, the dean runs a tight ship, but nevertheless, news gets out here, and countless conversations with you have made vivid that although this really is a marvelous occasion, your mood isn't simply triumphalist. You've seemed to me not just celebratory, but also contemplative. I'll therefore take this opportunity, this point of inflection in your lives, to offer a diagnosis of your and our collective condition, not to propose a cure, but much more modestly, in the hope that the diagnosis shines a new light on your own introspection. As the dean has just observed, you are, by acclamation, the finest new law graduates in the world. I don't rehearse this praise just as a bromide to set a mood and swell a speech's emotional progress. <laughs> Rather, I'll, I'll take the fact of your excellence as my starting point today, and then recover its causes and pursue its consequences. Some of these are bright and happy. Others lower more darkly both over the world and over your distinctive futures. It will be the task of your generation to disperse these clouds and to reclaim the sunshine, including for yourselves. When I say that you're the country's best new lawyers, I assert a concrete, determinate, and determinable fact, and a fact whose demonstration has dominated a large portion of your lives for a very long time. Consider how you got to Yale. In the autumn of 2011, perhaps 75,000 candidates applied to American law schools. Perhaps 3,000 of these applied to Yale. The law school takes admissions very seriously. Three faculty members independently evaluate each file. And following this process, Yale admitted about 8% of JD applicants. Our LLM program similarly admits only about 9% of those who apply. Finally, Almost nine out of every 10 people whom we admit, which is to say virtually everyone, eventually enrolls. In other words, you're sitting here today because you ranked among the top three-tenths of 1% of a massive meritocratic competition, and one in which all the competitors conspicuously agree about which is the biggest prize. The admissions competition that brought you here wasn't an aberration or an isolated moment, moreover. Rather, most of you, although not all, came to the law school from highly selective colleges. Acceptance rates at Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and Yale colleges, to pick some familiar examples, have also averaged around 8% in recent years. And not all of you, but again most, came to college from highly competitive high schools, and indeed in many cases from highly selective elementary schools and even preschools. 
a friend, a friend who teaches at Harvard recently wrote to me that his obviously charming twins were rejected from all 19 preschools to which they applied. <laughs> so our admissions process, in all its patterns of planning and trimming, its rituals of stage-managed self-presentation, its rhythms of ambition, hope, and worry, was for you a familiar right. For your entire lives, you've studied, worked, practiced, trained, and drilled, and then you've been inspected. And finally, you're sitting here after all, you've been selected. Nor did the training and competition end when you arrived here. People, including me, are fond of saying, perhaps a little prayerfully, that the rat race ends at Yale Law School's door, but you don't believe it. More important, you act as if you don't believe it. <laughs> you do almost whatever is necessary to produce, to continue to distinguish yourselves, to learn, to shine. There's a sense in which you're right, or at least reasonable, to stay in the rat race. You all know the list of plums that you're competing for, and you agree astonishingly widely which are sweetest. This intensifies your ongoing competition. The clerkships, executive branch posts, public interest jobs, elite law firm partnerships and professorships that you overwhelmingly most want all have hundreds of aspirants for each opening. A pervasive, effortful, and studied competition thus dominates and even overwhelms virtually every year of the first three decades of an elite American professional's life. The competition has become so ingrained that I imagine it's hard for you to imagine life without it. But the competition is new. It's a striking innovation in American economic and social life, a stark departure from past practice. Even Yale Law School once admitted nearly a third of those who applied, and by shockingly casual means. A mid-century graduate recently reported that he came here after Jack Tate, who was then Dean of Admissions, told him at a college fair, straightway and on the basis of a single conversation, you'll get in if you apply. Things began to change in the 1960s. At Yale College, President Kingman Brewster opened Yale to merit over birth, saying that he did not, and these are his words, intend to preside over a finishing school on Long Island Sound. Brewster replaced the entire admissions office staff at once with a new staff that increased the incoming class's SAT verbal score by 100 points within a year. Once the meritocratic genie escaped its bottle, moreover, it grew inexorably, and it continues to grow ever stronger. The admissions competition at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford colleges is today three times as intense as it was just 20 years ago. The competition to get into Yale Law School is four times as intense as it was at mid-century. So you've reached this day by winning again and again at an unprecedentedly demanding and single-minded competition. It makes sense, therefore, to ask what victory brings. Some good and even wonderful things. Others are less wonderful. But we'll begin with the good. <laughs> First, <laughs> no, it's, this is good. Uh. <laughs> You know, you join a community really suffused with astonishing energy and talent. This shows itself in the ordinary, everyday life of the school. Your skill and dedications as students make teaching here almost effortless. You obliterate the line between pedagogy, properly so-called, and ordinary communication. It really is a privilege for all of us to be able to sit and stand in front of students regularly who have the property that if one explains something moderately clearly, they understand it. It, it's, you have no idea. <laughs> your, your immense talents also show themselves at exceptional moments. And a, a really powerful and moving example is the die-in demonstration that you organized last winter in the wake of police killings in Ferguson, Missouri and on Staten Island. You assembled over 500 people and over 30 organizations to concert it, forceful, insistently demanding yet responsible public action on short notice and at a time of great distress. Set aside for a moment the rightness of the end and marvel at the incredible effort and talent required to marshal those means. Second, your successes bring you immense wealth and status. 
First year associates in New York, as you likely all know, today earn over $160,000 a year. A law firm now exists that generates profits per partner exceeding $5 million annually. And fully 70 firms now generate more than $1 million of, pro of profits per partner every year. These vast sums are also new. Elite lawyers' real incomes have roughly tripled in the past half century, which is more than 10 times the rate of income growth experienced by the Moreover, this explosion in elite lawyers' incomes is not a or even isolated phenomenon. Instead, it fits into a wider pattern of rising elite labor incomes across our economy. You probably know that the share of total national income going to the top 1% of earners has roughly doubled in the past three decades. But it's perhaps less familiar that fully four-fifths of that increase comes from rising wages paid to elite labor. And it may be more surprising still to learn that the top 1% of earners, and indeed even the top one-tenth of 1%, 1 today owe fully four-fifths of their incomes to their labor. That's unprecedented in all of human history. American meritocracy has created a state of affairs the richest person out of every thousand overwhelmingly works for a living. This perhaps explains the otherwise incomprehensible measure of agreement among aspirants for elite training about which plums are most desirable. Finally, the immense incomes on offer to you commingle with high social status. The older hereditary caste order for centuries imposed a social taint on those who work. Those who work not from passion or for exploit or as a calling, but work industriously for wages. But that stigma, which remained at mid-century, has today been entirely erased. More directly and immediately, elite lawyers' incomes, including when diluted by sabbaticals from private public service, will place you comfortably above the economic dividing line that comprehensively separates the rich from the rest in an increasingly unequal America. Perhaps most critically, your lawyerly skills will finance training your children through private schools and myriad other enrichments to thrive in the hyper-competition that you have yourselves, in effect, just won. This, then, is where things stand. We've become a profession and a society constituted by meritocracy, massively intensified, and massively competitive elite training meets massively inflated economic and social rewards for elite work. You, in virtue of sitting here today, belong to the elite, to the new superordinate working class. This structure, whatever its virtues, also imposes enormous costs. Most obviously, it's a catastrophe for our broader society, for the many, the nearly 99%, who are excluded from the increasingly narrow elite. There's an irony here. Brewster and embraced meritocracy consciously in order to defeat privilege. Under the prior regime, pedigree so dominated university admissions that the privileged excruciatingly underperformed once on campus. At Yale, for example, the traditional feeder prep schools, which accounted for perhaps of a, quarter, a quarter of the class, were underrepresented in Phi Beta Kappa by a factor of nearly 20 to 1. <laughs> William F. Buckley, Jr., in seeking to mock meritocracy shortly after Brewster's reforms, instead presented an object lesson in the unfairness that meritocracy sought to redress. You will laugh, he wrote in attacking Brewster's admissions revolution, but today it is true that a Mexican-American from El Paso High with identical scores on the achievement test and identically ardent recommendations from the headmaster, has a better chance of being admitted to Yale than Jonathan Edwards the 16th from the St. Paul's School. Just so, the meritocrat replies. But although it was once the engine of American social mobility, meritocracy today blocks equality of opportunity. The student bodies at elite colleges once again skew massively towards wealth. Students from households in the top quarter of the income distribution outweigh those from the bottom quarter by 14 to 1. And students from the top quarter outweigh the middle two quarters combined, the entire American middle class, by nearly 3 to 1. The skew towards wealth at the most elite universities is almost inconceivably greater still. At Harvard College and here at Yale Law School, 
two places where students have skillfully and bravely compiled data that their universities suppress. As many students come from households in the top 1% as from the entire bottom half of the distribution. These facts will shock, and they're designed to shock, but a moment's clear reflection should render them unsurprising and even inevitable. The excess educational investment over and above what middle class families can provide that children born to a typical 1% or household receive is equivalent economically to a traditional inheritance of between five and $10 million per child. Exceptional cases always exist, as some of you sitting here prove. But in general, children from poor or even middle class households can't possibly compete when they apply to places like Yale with people who've imbibed this massive, sustained, planned, and practiced investment from birth, or even in the womb. And workers with ordinary training can't possibly compete in the labor market with super-skilled workers possessed of the remarkable training that places like Yale Law School provide. American meritocracy has thus become precisely what it was invented to combat, a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across generations. Meritocracy now constitutes a modern-day aristocracy of a kind, purpose-built for a world in which the greatest source of wealth is not land or factories, but human capital, the free labor of skilled workers. This observation refocuses the argument on you, on the modern-day aristocrats. Now, you are not, nor for that matter am I, natural objects of moral or political sympathy. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, the system does not serve you well either. To begin with, life at the top today requires immense sustained effort, extraordinarily hard work. This also is new. In 1962, the American Bar Association could confidently declare that there are approximately 1,300 fee-earning hours per year available to the normal lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Today, by contrast, a major law firm pronounces with equal confidence that a quota of 2,400 billable hours, quote, if properly managed, unquote, is, quote, not unreasonable. <laughs> Billing 2,400 hours in a year requires working from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m., six days a week, without vacation or sick days, for every week of the year. Nor are these Stakhanovite hours the peculiar property of large private practice. Elite public interest lawyers, elite government lawyers, and even elite law professors all work hours that would have been thought unimaginable because degrading by an earlier American elite that constituted itself self-consciously as a leisure class. Today, they're a badge of honor. When I asked my professional responsibility class how many of them had once sent an email, either late at night or early in the morning, in order to demonstrate their, bus their busyness, two-thirds of the hands went up. And then someone told me, there's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, embracing these long hours reflects an adjustment to a new economic necessity. A rich landowner might extract rents from his estate idly as a rentier. But where the source of a person's wealth is her human capital, her skills, she can't get income except by mixing this capital with her own contemporaneous labor. Nevertheless, these hours, just by their flat, dispassionate, unyielding length, inflict a heavy human burden on those who work them. The imaginative requirements of living as a superordinate worker impose a second and profound burden on the new elite a burden whose full weight you are the very first generation to feel. The social and economic caste order in which we're now embedded, including through our celebrations today, demands that you comprehend yourselves on instrumental terms. Your own talents, training, and skills, your self-same persons, today constitute your greatest assets, the overwhelmingly dominant source of your wealth and prestige. To promote your eliteness, to secure your caste, you must ruthlessly manage your training and labor. Moreover, and you're the first generation in this position, you've had to do this, to act as asset managers whose portfolios contain yourselves for your whole lives, certainly as long as you can recall. To manage an asset not for its own sake, but rather as a means to an end, is to alienate oneself from that asset's true nature and intrinsic value. The older rentier elite might administer its lands and factories in this way, without bearing any significant cost. 
But administering one's capacities, one's own person, in this instrumental mode is another thing entirely. To live in this way is quite literally to use oneself up. Such a life proceeds under a pervasive shadow. At its worst, it squanders the capacity to set and pursue authentically embraced, intrinsically valued goals. Even at its best, this life involves deep alienation. Finally, the choices that you faced again and again over the course of your lives have trained you to measuring your life in this way, as with coffee spoons. It can seem, with warrant, as if there is no alternative to the bright, unreal path that has led you here. Once more, the elite should not, they have no right to, expect sympathy on this account from those who remain excluded from the privileges and benefits of high caste. And yet the human burdens of life as a rentier of one's own human capital remain real and weighty. I believe from our many conversations that they explain why you approach our celebrations today in a contemplative mood. So this is where we've arrived. We've constructed a, a gilded cage that ensnares the rich and excludes the rest. What then is the way forward? I wish that I knew. I could tell you, I could tell you, and I would mean it, that when you find an opportunity to trade a little money or status for a lot of freedom, you should take it. You should take it every time. But that thought, although honest and heartfelt, is a chicanery. It's akin to insisting that the rat race is over. The fact remains, for each of you individually, all the forces that have brought you to this point remain in play. Every incentive is wrong. But the broader picture is more hopeful. The new aristocracy promotes human flourishing for no one, certainly not for the excluded rest, nor even for the ensnared rich. We're trained to think of economic inequality as presenting a zero-sum game, to suppose that redistribution to benefit the bottom simply must burden the top. But this is not such a case. Reforms that democratize training and talent would benefit everybody. Such democratic reforms would restore the bulk of Americans to full participation in an economic and social order from which they have been for several decades now increasingly excluded. And democratic reforms invite the elite, you all, to accept an almost costless diminution in wealth and status in exchange for a massive, precious increase in leisure and liberty, a reclaiming of your authentic selves. The problem remains, of course, how to make the global trade, how to reestablish a democratic social order. Again, I don't know. But I do know that a winning trade, winning for everybody, exists. And I also know that you, with your vast talents, enormous discipline, and immense energy, are better placed than anyone else in our social order to conceive and to broker the deal. You should keep a reborn democratic equality always in mind as you go forth, in your small decisions as well as your large ones. You should support and sustain one another whenever, whenever you choose equality and freedom over caste and wealth for yourself and for others. And you should demand that Yale Law School loyally supports you as you make these choices. The democratic project has no better midwife than you, and so much turns on your efforts now including, not least of all, your own futures. Thank you, and Godspeed.